but here we are. Welcome to everybody. This is our joint clinical education and research working group meeting after a summer hiatus. So it's really exciting to be, to be back, to start off with this, and to have all of our working groups meeting together for some really rich discussion and to, to get to know each other a bit more. These are our working group members, and, and I can send these slides out afterwards so you can know a little bit more about who's on each group. We have a very full meeting, so I will just get right into it. I don't know if Prasad is, is on yet, but we do have a new clinical working group member, so welcome to Prasad. And as all of you on the call know, we did send out a volunteer commitment over the summer, which was very helpful because we've had people who their situations have changed and they were no longer able to participate, yet they were still on the working group. So those who of you who are on the call, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to the volunteer commitments and, and letting us know that this was still a good fit for you and that you agreed to the responsibilities or expectations. And we also thank those who told us that their their priorities had changed and they were not able to fulfill the responsibilities because that opens up another spot, which are limited. There's only three spots per discipline on each working group. And, and so to all of you, I say thank you and don't hesitate if, if things change and you're not able to participate anymore. Just let us know and we'll, we'll uh, appreciate you and find somebody else to, to fill your spot who wants to be and is able to, to fulfill the responsibility at that time. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. There were several people who needed to miss it and wanted to listen again, so we're trying this new format where I put the agenda on these PowerPoint slides that will help focus us and record it nicer to look at. So I'll pause there and hand it over to the, the co-chairs who are on and, and ask if there's anything you wanted to add in the welcome or anything that I have forgotten. And let's see. And then and the next thing after this will be the round table. Yeah, I, I think that you covered all the, the high points very well, Beth. So I don't have anything else to add. Thank you, Jim. Nothing specific from me. This is Dale, other than uh, welcome back, everybody. I hope uh, hope everybody enjoyed a wonderful summer. Uh, I know it's up here in Minnesota. It's uh, It seems to go by much too quickly every year, but uh, so thanks for thanks for rejoining us. Thanks, Dale. And I can see that Beth is on. So, Beth, if, if you're – oh, I haven't. I've muted you. Sorry. I'm – this new format, the go-to webinar versus the go-to meeting, it requires me to keep going through the list and unmuting those of you who I can. So I am doing that. And Beth, I've just unmuted you. Hi, this is Beth. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Good. All right. Thanks, Beth. And Bo, you're on as well. So if you want. Yeah. To Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back after the break. Uh, thanks, Beth, for a great introduction. I'm looking forward to a, a, another productive year ahead. Thank you. Thank you. And did I did I miss anybody? Marsha was not able to be on today. Okay. Fantastic. Well. We can go right into the roundtables and announcements. And Dale, if, if uh, you wouldn't mind facilitating it, that would be really great. And, and we have sure. one announcement that I received ahead of time, so I, I put it on there. And then uh, after that, we're open. Okay. So thanks, Beth. And thanks for this uh, new format of uh, with the PowerPoint slides. I think that's a nice. I would agree that's a nice, clean way to, to sort of see what we're talking about and keep folks focused. So appreciate you putting that together. Um, just as so as a reminder, we like to take a few minutes at the beginning of these calls. And uh, uh, at least this is what we've done in education and clinical working group. I realize we've got all three groups represented here. So uh, I think they've had similar <laughs> similar discussions in, in all three groups, but uh, just a, a quick roundtable at the beginning to give folks an opportunity to uh, share any uh, announcements, challenges, uh, requests for feedback about things they're working on, um, 
relative to to the the mission of the collaborative. If there's uh, any any anything that uh, folks are excited to share with the group, uh, now is the time. And you can see on the screen there the the one example of uh, SCU receiving an NIH grant for a project. So that'd be a good example of the the types of things that we're looking for during this roundtable sharing time. So uh, anybody. Uh, should I should I just kind of comment a little bit on this uh, project? Yeah. That would be great. That would be yeah. great. Thanks, Jim. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. It, is Dr. Anu on the call? Dr. Anu is also a research working group member. She had told uh, me she was unable to make today's call, but normally she would okay. be. Well, uh, Dr. Anu is a good friend and uh, co. Uh, we're co-PIs on this project uh, that we're very excited about uh, at SCU. It's been about 20 years since SCU had received any kind of NIH funding. So um, we're, the, and, and the, this grant is an R15 grant, which was a, a, a particular kind of funding mechanism that was suggested to me by uh, part of CALSA at NIH, whom many of you probably know. Uh, and uh, the R15 mechanism is intended kind of for the, the little dogs, the institutions which haven't had much of a recent uh, track record of, of NIH funding. Uh, and, and it also allows for involving students, where students are actually compensated for hands-on participation in uh, NIH-funded uh, research, and so, so that's a particular feature of the of the R15 grant. Uh, and uh, so, what we're going to be doing, uh, what I think, what you know, sort of the contribution, the sort of unique contribution that this grant is going to make to uh, the, the evidence, is looking at long-term care of patients with chronic low back pain. We often see clinical trials and other kinds of studies uh, of patients with uh, chronic low back pain, but uh, those the patients aren't often followed for a very long period of time. And chronic low back pain is defined as three months or longer, but a lot of patients have low back pain for a whole lot longer than three months, whether it's chronic or recurrent or some, you know, variety of, of, of um, chronic low back pain. It can go on for years and years, and often patients seek care year after year. Uh, so we wanted to kind of look at long-term comparing spinal manipulation, uh, the value of spinal manipulation versus prescription drug therapy. Uh, and it will be in the, in the Medicare population. We'll be examining claims data and also s actually surveying a sample of the same patients whose claims we're looking at, uh, actually sending them out uh, surveys by mail. And uh, so uh, b because both of these uh, therapies, although widely used, uh, the effectiveness is uncertain. Uh, for long-term care, both for spinal manipulation and, and for prescription drug therapy. And we'll be looking uh, in particular at opioid therapy. And of course, there are serious safety concerns about long-term uh, opioid use. So that's kind of the, the thing in, the, in a nutshell. And uh, um, sorry, Dr. New can't, can't be with us today, because I'm sure she, she'd like to share something about it too. Uh, so, I think um, if there, you know, any questions, be happy happy to answer them. But that's that's uh, that's a, I think a you know kind of a summary of what we're what we're going to be doing. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Jim, for sharing that. Any uh, any quick questions relative to that? Otherwise, if there's others that have uh, projects to share or. Uh, Anything that they're they're working on that they'd like some feedback from the group, uh, this is the time to to bring it forward. Well, so uh, maybe I'm not hearing anyone uh, having any burning issues, and I know we've got a lot of other things on the agenda, so. 
Uh, maybe we can just move on to our, uh, looks sure. like uh, project updates are next on the agenda. Sure, we can do that. And, and Bo, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I was thinking you, you might want to make an announcement. Uh, and if you do, this would be a good time. And if you don't, we can. Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. great. I'm happy to do that. I just didn't know if now was the, the yeah, right time. I think it'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, um, so yeah, I'd want to let everybody know that uh, I'm uh, no longer at Pacific College of Oriental Medicine as the academic dean, and I'm now at Monmouth University uh, on the Jersey Shore as the uh, founding director of the Institute for Health and Wellness. Uh, so this is an initiative taken on by the university to uh, look at uh, research, educational programs, and service to the community across a variety of different um, schools here, different focuses, uh, the universities, 40% of their educational programs are in the health sciences, so they're interested in having an, an institute that will cover those uh, many different disciplines uh, for the purposes of uh, developing new programs, coming up with uh, innovative research projects, and uh, working closely with the medical centers here in, uh, in sort of central New Jersey. Uh, so we, yeah, we're closely uh, located to Hackensack Meridian and Robert Wood Johnson uh, Barnabas, and uh, we'll be working closely with them as well. So yeah, for me personally, um, I had spent many, many years at Pacific College and have you know very fond attachment. And of course, I'm an acupuncturist and Chinese herbalist myself. So um, it was in many ways you know a difficult decision, but. I felt strongly that uh, we need to sort of move out of our silos and get uh, into uh, arenas that take us uh, across all the medical disciplines. And I think this will better help the complementary integrative therapies uh, to be um, more strongly positioned in these uh, healthcare environments. So that's from a personal point of view, you know, was the motivation behind doing this. and. Uh, you know, I'd love to see a lot of the things that we do and know bring significant benefit to patients uh, being more commonly used in mainstream healthcare environments. So I'm ho really hoping that uh, my position here uh, will help to facilitate that. That's really fantastic, Bo. Congratulations. That's, uh, yeah, that's thanks, wonderful Sarah. news. Yeah, good luck to you. We're excited to we'll be excited and interested to uh, hear updates on uh, on how it's going. Yeah, ditto, Bo. Congratulations on, on the new position. That's, that's really exciting. Yeah, thanks, Jim. All right. Uh, anybody else while uh, Bo was sharing that? Anybody else come up with anything? Yeah, I'd, I'd just like share? to say um, uh, welcome to our executive director, Alyssa Westerl. Uh, welcome to SCU uh, to, with the offices now. Uh, here on campus, and uh, I was in attendance at a, a faculty meeting yesterday here at SCU where, where uh, was, uh, addressed uh, SCU faculty and just talked about uh, the collaborative and, and what its mission is and, and um, a little bit of the history and, you know, some of the uh, various projects that uh, uh, the uh, collaborative has, has been sponsoring and uh, it was a good thing, of course. You know, a lot of a lot of folks here don't know about the collaborative, so uh, it was it was a nice introduction uh, both to the collaborative and and for Alyssa, you know, someone with the presence here on on the SU campus now. Yeah, well, that's uh, yeah, really fantastic. We're thrilled to have her in that position. Is Alyssa on the call by any chance? I am actually. Yeah, I oh, just okay. meeting myself. Hello, everyone. Hi, I joined a little late. Um, okay. Yeah, thanks for that shout out, <laughs> Jim. Um, on the heels of these exciting announcements um, by both Jim and Bo, congrats to you both. Um, yeah, and thanks for mentioning that, Jim, about the opportunity to address the faculty yesterday at STU. I had just to scant 10 minutes, and what I ended on was a slide about the openings uh, for the various uh, disciplines in our working groups, <laughs> and I encouraged uh, the um, members of the faculty to, you know, to stay in touch and, and if they had some questions to, um, to let me know, uh, particularly about the working groups. So I, w I did want to 
focus with the SEU faculty on a little bit more on the on the working groups. I only had ten minutes, so um, you know it's a lot of ground to cover when you're trying to acclimate um, a group that is heretofore unfamiliar with your work. You know, to kind of to your mission, vision, history of accomplishments, and stuff. So, um, but yeah, I would, you know, I was able to do a quick overview, and I think that. SCU um, is enjoying the, the proximity to to us and to our work. Um, that's the feedback that I'm getting, and it's really nice to have friends like Jim Whedon on board there and exciting things going on at SCU. Um, you know, Dr. Anu and Jim, they're having a, um, they're actually having a, a celebration on September 19th uh, to acknowledge the great work and the grant uh, the well, two grants, right, Jim, that are coming in uh, based on on their work, and um, that's uh, going to be uh, next Wednesday. So that's a nice thing. It's a it's a very uh, it's a really nice environment there. So good stuff. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that, Alyssa, and appreciate your efforts in trying to keep our helping us keep our uh, working groups uh, fully staffed. So mm -hmm. and. Uh, and thanks again to Beth for laying out the creating that expectations document and such. I think that uh, helps folks uh, understand a little more clearly what uh, what our expectations are and participation in the working groups. And uh, of course, appreciate all those that uh, signed off on that and are are here today. So, all right, we ready to move on? Beth? We are. Uh, thank you all so much. And Alyssa, thanks for promoting the working group work and activities and memberships we can fill up with with more really good members apologies there is some background noise so I will as soon as I'm finished talking mute myself again wanted to give a very quick working group project update by saying that we are coming up with a project selection process so it will be coming up with projects that are not only come from the interest of you all, members of the working groups, but to be sure that they are well supported with uh, volunteer leadership and aligned with the priorities and resources for the collaborative. So you'll, you'll see that soon. Going forward, there will be a time in each meeting for a brief update from project group members, and we'll have a, a more structured approach to this with opportunity for feedback from those on the working group, not on the actual project. We have not formalized that to date, so the, there hasn't been much of a working group project update. Sometimes members are on and able to give updates and sometimes not. This will really increase the connectivity between the projects and the working groups and make sure that there's good feedback loops all around. And then I will send a summary of the working group projects to all of you, all working group members, quarterly. Right now I am preparing such a report for the board, and so it really makes sense that all of you are able to see what's happening in projects that you may not be a member of. It, it will help, uh, help everybody. So that's the update. Are there any questions from anybody on that? Okay, you can always let me know by email. And now for the, the heart of our call today, the discussion, we actually do have a little bit more than 35 minutes, thanks to everybody for being so succinct in the earlier part. And also thanks to those of you who sent in replies to these three questions ahead of time, and I did put them on the slides that follow. And I had a meeting with the co-chairs yesterday and we gave a lot of thought to how to orchestrate this part of the meeting so everybody could contribute. We have a limited time, we want to hear from everybody and, and we want to stay on point. And some of the outcomes we're looking for are ideas for presentations we, we might want to do in the working groups coming up, possible ideas for, for projects involving all three working groups, and having working group members get to know each other a little bit better. So in the interest of all those things, please state your name when speaking so we can get used to what your voice sounds like and who you are. And 
each, uh, we have three co-chairs who will facilitate each of the questions. We have about 10 minutes for each, and then we'll have a little bit of time for a wrap-up at the end. So I, I think that's all I need to say. Beth, I'd like to turn it over to you to start us off. Hello, everyone. This is Beth Howlett. Um, and I agreed to take the first piece because this set of questions actually arose from a presentation I uh, co-authored with a couple folks in March related to opportunities for us to develop research culture at OCOM after our R25 grant um, ran out and also um, talking about practice-based uh, research next networks. And uh, Diane posed these excellent questions at the end and we just ran out of time. Um, so thank you all for making 30 minutes to, to actually give them some space. Um, so in terms of opportunities we have for collaboration between integrative healthcare practices, um, in my presentation I mentioned something called AWESOME, the Oregon Collaborative for Integrative Medicine, which is a really unique feature of proximity here in Portland, Oregon, where we have multiple health colleges, each siloed as their own university, but we collaborate um, through um, AWESOME. And that takes multiple forms, I think all of which hit upon ACIH's um, areas of interest in research and clinic and education. And um, through that group, we collaborate on sort of more didactic opportunities like uh, Grand Rounds presentations. But we also uh, cohabitate a number of off-site clinics where all of our schools send students. And those locations have data sets where we've talked about doing practice-based research. Um, and also just real opportunities for grounded clinical learning because although we're all in those spaces, we're not always there together. Um, so looking at opportunities even to use like the peers documents from ACIH, as, ACIH to, to further develop those sites and, and create models, um, but also um, how we can just create a, a, a space where we already are and a space within that space to actually do real casework together because that may or may not be happening um, at some of the sites where all the awesome schools are represented. Um, so that's just one example of an opportunity. Um, it's an opportunity for us here in Portland, but also it's a model we can take to national conferences, things like that. Um, I don't want to monopolize any time if folks have questions, but also if they want to contribute any of their unique answers to this question. So I cede the, the floor. Thanks, Beth. And, and I muted a few folks who had not muted themselves, so please mute yourself when you're not talking and unmute yourself now if you want to talk and I will go through and unmute the, the, the folks that I had muted. So while we're waiting for people to speak up, and do put something in the chat if you're unable to speak up and you want to. Here are some responses that people had sent in in advance of the meeting. Kieran, who is on the research working group, said bring opportunities for our schools to engage in IPEC together as a means of tackling this issue, attitudes in students and faculty toward other professions as a team. It does seem that many schools struggle with the same issue but lack the traction, resources, or opportunity to affect large-scale change, and this is something that, that he would like to work on. Nancy Conway, who's on the clinical working group, suggested creating new multidisciplinary models of care in step with existing health care service lines. That was, let's see. So how might different disciplines work together with conventional uh, practitioners? for non-pharma pain management? How might integrative medicine disciplines work together to improve patient outcomes in oncology? So that's, we'll just start there and I'll, I'll go back to, to the first question, see if that prompts any, any discussion. Well, I'll, I'll maybe chime in and say just this doesn't really maybe answer the question specifically as it's worded, but suggests that, uh, you know, I think sometimes we, um, with the phrase or that 
that title, Integrative Healthcare Practices. You know, when I first read that, I assume that uh, I think of our, quote unquote, our professions, uh, those that are represented specifically in the collaborative. But uh, I think there's um, at least as much opportunity to collaborate with, um, how should we say it, Western or, uh, you know, more mainstream uh, healthcare practices. And a good example of that is, you know, the movement of hospital-based uh, massage therapy back into hospital environments and, uh, and a number of other practices as well. That one's on my mind because we're presenting on it at the upcoming AIHM conference. But so I, I just... I guess I just wanted to say that out loud that as uh, as we think about integrative healthcare practices, I know we're we've sort of um, uh, uh, taken tried to take possession of maybe of that of that title, but uh, I'm not sure that that's appropriate. I I just I offer I guess that there are uh, that that mainstream medicine, if we look at the definite definition of integrative practice, putting the patient at the center and and uh, incorporating all, you know, exactly what they need at the right time. Um, maybe there's a, a broader way of thinking about that term. So I'll, I guess I just want to throw that out as context, at least the way I'm thinking of it for that question. I don't know how others feel about that. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you, Dale. When I read that question, I think, well, you know, um, the opportunities are that we're all interested in helping patients get better, basically. Um, so, you know, there's, I think, enormous opportunities for collaboration. But I think once we start to bring in all disciplines, um, uh, you know, those that would go under the biomedical label included, then a lot of challenges, you know, come up and they're That's sort right. of in two categories. Firstly, the potential overlapping of scope of practice and turf wars and and then the other is that, you know, we have a lack of uh, comparative effectiveness research to indicate what are the, the better choices for individual patients. And then sort of another arena is it's very confusing for patients if they have the capacity to choose different approaches to a, you know, a particular healthcare problem. So you know, I think all of these arenas provide you know, enormous opportunities for collaboration, whether it's learning how to better work together and manage the politics and the best interests of the patient, you know, doing research to find out which best approaches and also helping patients navigate throughout you know, what is rapidly becoming kind of a new uh, landscape of healthcare. And another thing we can do, and thank you, thank you all who have spoken so far, is because there there is definitely overlap between the three questions, we can also run through the other two and then do a go-around and actually try to call on everybody at the end so if people are feeling shy, they'll still have a chance to, to contribute. Uh, I'll just chime in a little bit here um, and, uh, you know, I sort of hesitate to talk about this because I'm, I'm no longer in practice. Uh, but, you know, I, I think, you know, theoretically there are lots of opportunities, but kind of on the ground, maybe not, not so many because we're, you know, a lot of folks are still kind of practicing in their, in their silos. Uh, this uh, development of, of integrative practice units where, you know, clinical care is organized around the patient and the patient's problem uh, as opposed to being organized around, you know, specialties or departments. I think the, the, these integrative practice units represent the, perhaps the, the best opportunity for collaboration, uh, you know, between uh, different kinds of practices. Um, so, you know, I, I guess um, 
whatever can be done to kind of promote that model, I think will um, facilitate more collaboration, you know, because it, it, you kind of have to have a framework for it. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Jim. And also just developing relationships between clinicians so that there's more receptivity to different approaches. Uh, this is Mike Miles. Hi, Mike. Um, hi, how are you doing? Um, I, I'm just going to tag on to what Dale said earlier, and uh, I don't know if this is, this is not addressing one of those questions per se, but kind of overlaps them all. Um, and it, I've got really a couple of comments to make. Um, you know, the, the, uh, still we have a bit of the elephant in the room, which is what is integrative healthcare practice. And uh, we think it's us working with them, quote unquote, and uh, they think it's uh, uh, having a, uh, you know, someone get um, uh, uh, a crystal while they're after an operation waiting. To, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but, uh, but they have their idea that conventional healthcare practices, you know, think it's wonderful to have you know, massage therapists go in and do something, but uh, we, what we're looking at legitimately integrating uh, and getting away from this crazy alternative label, I think that's at least what I've always thought. Uh, and part of that has to do with part of that movement, and we just don't seem to ever address it, because maybe it's our dirty little secret, that we have a lot of weird practices out there. And um, I was at, a, at an ACC meeting a couple of, uh, maybe last year, I can't remember now, they, uh, someone from Palmer talked about uh, cultural authority, and he was bang on. He said he defines it as the progressive accumulation of public trust. And uh, the truth of the matter is, is that uh, I think you know all of us in all our fields, uh, particularly chiropractic, I can speak to that being one. Is you know we have like the you know good chiropractors and weird chiropractors, or, or however you want to define it, us and them. And as long as that exists, there's little public trust, and certainly we're not accumulating it. So I don't know if this group can work on, uh, you know, defining, um, uh, I, I don't know if I'm even saying this right now, I haven't thought it out longer, but, uh, but you know, just kind of um, defining what the ideal integrative practitioner would look like. Um, and uh, there's a lot of people in our field, our field sadly have attracted this, uh, a lot of truly alternative providers. Um, and some of that stuff's okay, I get that, but a lot of that stuff is just downright weird and causes uh, distrust in the public. Um, so, again, I don't, I don't know if that's a helpful comment, but if we don't, if we can't do something like that with a group like this of, of right-minded, uh, excellent, academically qualified leaders, then there's no hope. <laughs> so, so uh, I, you know, when we were at the uh, Georgetown meeting some years ago, the integrative uh, uh, conference in the uh, in the international conference in integrative uh, care uh, at Georgetown, we had Dr. Shoemaker uh, speak at that, and I don't know exactly what position he had, but I think he was former Surgeon General or Associate Surgeon General or something like that. Very, very positive about quote unquote integrative healthcare practices. But I spoke to him afterwards, and he said, you know, don't uh, like get real. I mean, this sounded great here; it's a great loving, but we have like 300 people. There's a million providers out there that have no flipping idea what you're doing in here and, and, and have no, no interest in it. I mean, so we've got to get real with this thing. Sounds good, uh, but we've got to um, uh, look at ways in which we can collectively uh, uh, document our practices, uh, create white papers, um, influence decision makers, and, and just, just raise the trust level a little bit. Like, we're not weird. We don't believe in a flat earth. Uh, we're interested in, uh, as one person mentioned earlier, um, and I, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, the one who's just taken over the uh, program in um, in New Jersey, congratulations, and that sounded exactly what you said was right on. We don't have the effectiveness data, we don't have hardly anything. Uh, so to admit that and to, to come out looking um, like we are willing to play by the same uh, general rules of logic, reasoning, and, 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 uh, and biomedical science, uh, I think would be very helpful. Yeah, yeah um, well thanks said. for that contribution. I, I'd love to sort of respond to a little bit of that. I mean, whilst I, you know, I, I guess it's the ugly truth what you're saying, but I also like to think that there is enough uh, complementary and integrated healthcare practitioners for us to 
carve out a, a niche in um, mainstream healthcare where you know we look like um, you know proper professionals and so it sort of brings maybe to question number two what current strategies well one that we've had going at ACIH for quite a while is uh, interprofessional education so edu you know we put out that booklet that helped people to understand what the requirements were in the five licensed um, complementary uh, therapy uh, professions um, but I think we could take that a step further by carving out a pathways for graduates to get into mainstream healthcare settings so that we can almost like focus the perception of our professions on the people that choose those paths and are, are chosen for those positions so that we can sort of represent ourselves that way and de-emphasize the more unusual people in the profession who would never choose you know to take that sort of a career path and I'm more than happy to work you know as a uh, providers in their own private practice. I just want to chime in um, on, on this uh, sort of thread with a question for the group. Um, you know, one thing that we've talked about through the Oregon um, health schools that sit at the table at Awesome is not just using something like the book and making it a part of curriculum, but actually having all of our students sit together in the same um, basic science classes and self-declare, you know, what path they're on, but actually begin some of that foundational learning together. And I know a lot of you work at, at larger, perhaps more multidisciplinary colleges. We're small and single purpose, but um, I'm just curious if any of you have programs like that and if you've seen um, it, it help create a sort of a better climate for um, both sides of, of, of the line in terms of the you know, designated complementary and the, the allopathic mainstream. Um, do folks use the textbook in those classroom situations and um, do you see it make a difference where integration happens even you know, in the foundational curriculum, um, not just the clinic? Well, I mean, I know they were doing that at Northwestern Health Sciences University. Dale, maybe you want to speak to that. I, I know that uh, they were teaching their chiropractic Chinese medicine massage therapy students together yeah. for their evidence-informed practice course. Yep. So the uh, actually, it's uh, the chiropractors and the acupuncturists are combined in in one course. The massage therapists are still uh, because they're at. Uh, you know, certificate, undergraduate certificate level. Um, we didn't feel like we could uh, roll them into that to that same level, but the acupuncturists and the massage, or the acupuncturists and the chiropractic students have been taught together in that EIP course for for a number of years now, and uh, uh, lots of success with that. We have a long. I I, I feel like we've got a ways to go. Um, in uh, combining, you know, getting folks into the, the same classroom. And, and more, um, I, I do think that, the, you know, there's, uh, there's opportunity throughout the curriculum, uh, beginning with basic sciences right at the, right, right at the front end. But uh, I feel like there's uh, uh, certainly much more we could do on the clinical side of things. We've had uh, some, we've done some piloting uh, in, our, in our clinic, uh, in our student clinic of having the chiropractors and massage therapists uh, partner together on on uh, specific cases of individuals coming in but uh, unfortunately a lot of times it's the the tail ends up wagging the dog and it's uh, you know uh, sort of silly things like uh, scheduling of uh, schedules that don't line up that get in the way of us uh, uh, creating some of these integrative clinical opportunities, and that's where I think maybe you know to we've the, where we've had more success is when we sort of create systems or models that uh, that are completely outside of our you know current uh, curriculum structure on campus. Uh, for example, the Pillsbury House Integrated Clinic that happens you know in the evening where. Uh, students from all three disciplines and and uh, mainstream medicine and also 
join and they're all in the same room together uh, consulting about a, a patient together, examining them together. But uh, yeah, certainly more, I, I agree that uh, uh, you know, starting that right from the beginning in basic science courses and any time we can get them together and just forming relationships, even if we're not, even if the content isn't, you know, super focused on learning about from and with each other, just creating those relationships can go a long way to uh, collaboration, you know, more more tendency toward collaboration down the line. And, and can we talk to... I, go ahead. I just wanted to as you yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is Melissa Wistrow. I um I want to just follow up on um, Dale's comment, just for a point in this discussion, um about uh, again Southern California University and what they're doing in interprofessional education um, intentionally with their first term students. They, in fact, I uh, also did a presentation about ACIH two to the chiropractic uh, acupuncture and oriental medicine and uh, PA group um, that had just matriculated their first term in their intro to healthcare and the healing arts, I think is the name of the course. Um, so it's a large group and they, so they start them right out of the gate, you know, with this kind of uh, interaction between these three um, sections. And uh, I think that that's, um, you know, a helpful way to start in terms of interprofessional um, perspective. And they, I think, I'm pretty sure that SCU, you know, very intentionally carries that sort of way of learning through um, the, you know, the, the programs um, as the students progress. Um, and, I, I mean, I, I think it's helpful, of course, that the PD group is, is immediately tracked or emerged in with um, with the acupuncture and the chiropractic students. And likewise, they also do, um, I think it was Dale who was talking about um, clinic experience. And they, I was, I sat in at a, uh, an evening clinic that was uh, led by Miles Farr, who is a medical uh, director of the Venice Family Clinic here in Southern Cal. And uh, he has a, a group that he, he has like an integrative clinic evening in which students participate from the various uh, schools of acupuncture. Um, so he has PAs in the room, he's got his caros, he's got his um, acupuncture, maybe he has other, um, I don't know if he has yoga therapists in the room, but he sort of mentors them in how they discuss cases amongst themselves before they go to clinic. That's how he preps them from um, not only from the angle of the other uh, cohorts there, right, the other disciplines represented in the room, but also uh, from his perspective as an MD. It's a really interesting process. And, um, you know, so it's, not, you know, just, just as an aside, I don't want to take too much time, but just wanted to share that experience. That's great. Well, thank you. Thank you all for sharing. And, and Dale, I wonder if, if part of the question, too, could be in, in what has already been shared and, and what people still have to share, what could ACIH possibly do to su support these uh, successful collaborations? Yeah, so our question, uh, second question, that we, as Beth indicated, we've sort of uh, uh, touched on a little bit already, but uh, current strategies within ACIH that can be translated for successful collaboration between practices. So what more can, how can we leverage what we're already doing with the collaborative? How, what, what could we do more of that would support some of uh, some of these examples of integration and collaboration that, uh, that we're discussing? So open that one up for discussion or if anybody wants to build on a on a previous point that's been made, uh, please, please do. This is Nikki. I'm. This is one of the parts that I sometimes get a little stuck with too. Of what, what is it that we can do in all these different areas? And and I was really struck by um, uh, the gentleman who was speaking about the ideal integrated practitioner and um, sort of putting together pieces around that, and not necessarily on that, but you know, with the conference coming up. Uh, in Brisbane, if there are folks that are planning to go there, if it wouldn't be of value to put together a symposium abstract um, 
to have conversations about maybe some of the projects that we're doing or some of the efforts to um, uh, provide uh, interdisciplinary education opportunities and the like and to share those strategies. Yeah, I think that's a good idea, Nikki. I, I like that. Great idea. Yep. Because I think there are a couple of things that we're already doing. Well, we've got the booklet into professional education, uh, helping uh, other people to understand training and that sort of thing associated with the complementary therapies. But Beth, we also started well, thinking about a training program to help graduates understand uh, hospital environments and that sort of thing, didn't we? I'm not sure how far that progressed, but. You know, that would be another one, helping mm -hmm. our graduates of our programs, yes. you know, feel more confident going into, you know, a, a biomedical environment. And then the other one that I think uh, what we've been discussing has touched on is that project we've been working on to help our colleges to develop collaborative relationships with research intensive institutions. So, that, so there's another one. That we're doing. Yeah, yeah that, that, well, that's a pretty novel piece of putting together to try and actually make a study of that process as well. Right. So yeah. Do you need to point. update? Or, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm thinking of going to the Brisbane meeting, Nikki. So if I, you know, definitely decide to do that, then I'd, I'd love to work on that with you if you're interested in doing that. Well, I will be there. Um, the uh, deadline is coming up. Well, I mean, we've got a few more weeks, but October, uh, it's October 5th, which translates to October 4th, our time, because it is it. Uh, Australian time. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and, and I think Kieran's going too, right? I don't know, Kieran, will you be there? If he's on the call. Kieran's not on, but I can send something oh. up following this meeting. Asking okay. anybody who's going to let us know. Okay, great, great. That's great. That might be that might be a, a, a an interesting effort is to get together, you know, show a hands of who will actually be attending that, and then yes. maybe uh, putting something together that highlights ACIH. Great, yeah, great idea. Great idea. Uh, I'll put something out after the meeting. Thank you, thank you both. And yeah, I think the general idea of uh, you know. Uh, finding conferences and opportunities and uh, to uh, to share our projects that we're working on and the mission of uh, ACIH in general um, I think that can that can go a long way to, to spread the word and uh, to get us into these conversations and then I had another thought too um, uh, particularly when uh, Beth H was speaking uh, about the practice-based research networks, and I've had opportunity to um, begin working with a with a integrative uh, complementary integrative medicine uh, nationwide um, PDRN in Australia, the Praki group, and um, wondering if there was any uh, resources or infrastructure that ACIH might be able to leverage that could potentially get one of those broader networks. And, and, and Beth, that might be something that uh, your group is already considering and, and looking at. Is that the case? or I'd say it's something we're considering. Well. So this we're is, having some sound problems. Yeah, this is this is Beth Rosenthal, and I, that's another thing. I'll I'll put out the question after this this meeting of, of who might be interested in following up with the PBRN idea. And right now we we've, we're at twelve fifty two Central Time, twelve fifty three Central Time. So I'm wondering if we want to touch upon the the last question, just sort of evolve. There there's a lot of overlap. So if if you have a comment that was meant to go earlier and you want to do it now, I think that's fine. But but Jim, can I turn it over to you to facilitate in the last few minutes our, our final question? Yeah, sure. So the question is, what are the major care questions that could benefit from these collaborations? 
I'm not, I'm not sure what, what we've defined yet, what the, the collaborations are or, or should be. So I guess we, I, I would just open it up to, you know, what are the major care questions that, that uh, folks think need to be addressed? What are, what are the, the burning issues? Um, and I'll, I'll just pose, pose a, a couple of things. Um, for, 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 for me, uh, I, I think probably the, the real burning issue is, is access to the integrative healthcare services and how, you know, kind of care delivery and what can we do to make it possible for, for folks to uh, have, you know, easier, uh, better, more affordable access to, to integrative healthcare services. And, um, and I, I guess this, the second question is kind of a burning thing for me, or at least the, the burning area. Uh, it, it's the whole opioids crisis and, and what can integrative healthcare uh, practitioners contribute uh, to, uh, you know, kind of addressing, I guess, up, you know, mostly upstream providing, you know, pain care to, uh, to uh, cool down this, this uh, epidemic, which uh, seems to be, you know, showing no signs of abating. But, but just a couple of you know suggestions. I just but let me just open it up and let's hear what other folks think are are the major care questions that, that need to be addressed at this time. Anybody? Don't be shy. If you're having trouble unmuting yourself, let me know in the chat and I'll see what I can do. I'll tell you another one in addition to pain and the opiate crisis, uh, emotional well-being and mental health. Yeah. I think is another really big one that... Um, I, yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, re resilience or resiliency, I'm not sure which is the, the, actually the correct term. Uh, is something that, that I think people are getting interested in uh, as, a, as an outcome for integrative health care services, uh, actually not only for, for patients but providers as well. Uh, I think uh, Darshan Mehta is going to uh, do a presentation uh, at, uh, at the upcoming uh, conference in, in San Diego on, on provider resilience, which I'm really looking forward to hearing about that. Um, and, and, and I guess also something that, that really hasn't been touched on too much, even in conventional uh, research, is the whole issue of uh, kind of we have, an, we, got, yeah, we have an epidemic of opioid use. We also have an epidemic of, of psychotropic medication use, which is chronic and goes on forever, you know, for, for many patients uh, using antidepressants. Uh, eventually want to get off these these drugs and there's very little support for it and very you know little understanding at least from the evidence base of, of how how to you know transition off of psychotropic medications onto more supportive integrative therapies this is not my an area of expertise for me but something I'm, I'm kind of passionate about uh, seeing somebody take on That's a great uh, that's a great mission, but uh, you're going to run up against the big brick wall with the drug companies that are going to uh, uh, you'll have a hard time, I think, even looking at possible comparative uh, studies there. But that doesn't mean we can't try it. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. 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 Oh, great. Hello, everyone. This is Jennifer Oliovnik, and I just um, wanted to chime in a little bit. I appreciate all the, the commentary. And um, Jim, I, I was kind of thinking about your comment, and I've been um, looking at the mental health piece of um, community response to the opioid epidemic here in Ohio in two small counties. And it seems that um, mental health is, you know, really the first piece of it. Um, a lot of people wind up on opioids and other drugs because mental health issues are largely untreated. 
And I think there is a huge opportunity um, there for integrative health and medicine to make an impact that is largely um, has not been explored yet. Uh, additionally, I also see mental health on college campuses. If you look at some of the most recent reports um, from college um, healthcare providers, the directors of the larger universities, the mental health um, stats have just skyrocketed over the last five years. Um, and again, this could be an opportunity for integrative health and medicine. Beth? Yes. Yeah, this, this is John. Hey, I'm John. Listening in here. Good. How are you all? John Weeks. Um, I uh, want to follow up on the last speaker and just say, I, I you know, this, obviously the, the pain in opioid dialogue is here with us. It's actually what got many of our disciplines going in the first place, um, uh, the certain pain. Um, and uh, I, I think, like, as I look at the, the, um, the content that Nancy sent over, you know, if you, I think, framing work around what can be done in that dialogue, like uh, Dale framing the idea of getting out into the conversation to focus really on how do we get more deeply into the conversation around pain, around opioid. There's so many different initiatives um, where our, our fields are still quite underrepresented. Um, uh, as, and I just, I just took a look at the federal law and um, that, that they're working on, and I didn't see any sign um, in, the, in an, uh, uh, an overview of, of what Congress is considering. There's, a, there's a, an opioid collaborative that was not going to have anybody in it from, from our disciplines or the integrative MDs, as far as I could see. It looks like we're moving to get somebody there. Um, <clears throat> I just learned from Dan Churkin that I guess Liza is part of a of a working group that's associated with the Global Forum. You know, I don't know if there are ways that the these um, a, a workshop a committee associated with the Global Forum that's on opioids and or chronic pain. But I don't know if the working groups could, in some ways, really support that initiative. Um, um, anyway, I, I think that you know, taking the ideas and framing them in and around that dialogue not only captures something topical, it's something that's, it's just, there's just new things popping up here and there, and too often there's no link. Um, yeah. And of course, there are issues related to education, related to uh, clinical, related to research um, uh, associated with all of this. So it might be a good way to really kind of frame up and focus um, some some of the the initiatives. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Well, we are we are at the hour. I'm I'm wondering for for those who can stay on a few extra minutes. There was a few people who we didn't get to hear at all from. So I'll just uh, I'll ask uh, Don. I don't know if you're able to. Maybe Don was not. Don was having trouble with her mic, and I don't think Don is still on. Uh, Courtney. Thank you for, for being on. Is there anything you wanted to say as we, as we wrap up? Uh, sure. Thanks, Beth. Um, I thought this has been a great conversation. And in being on the research working group, I think there are a lot of fruitful questions being asked here today uh, for collaboration. And I would just add that in addition to what Jim had mentioned around access to care models, I think that goes even deeper to talk about the ways in which the integrative health disciplines can help push forward community engagement models in healthcare, as well as to cultivate a more representative workforce uh, for each of our different disciplines, as we do remain pretty homogenous in terms of our demographics and backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So that's just what I would add here today, and I think that uh, that interdisciplinary research as it's focused on health inequities, especially in the health professions. Uh, is a ripe area for funding, as new funding announcements come out daily for that. So that's an exciting area to consider. Well, thank you so much. This has been a really, really rich discussion. Of course, we needed more time, and I'm really glad that it's a good problem to have. 
And that, that's, that's it for our meeting today. And uh, I'll ask the co-chairs if there's anything else to say before we, we wrap up to, to please do that. And I'll, I'll say my goodbye now and thanks. Uh, just uh, this is Dale. Just uh, thanks to all those for being for everybody who for being on the call and uh, for everybody that uh, contributed to the conversation. Excellent points as always, and uh, look forward to uh, look forward to next time and everything we're working on in, in, uh, until then. And thank you, Beth, for facilitating. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Great job, Beth. Thank you so much. It's great, great to have everybody's voices. I'm really excited about our, our upcoming year. And uh, thank you to, to, to Bo and Beth, our other co-chairs on the call. And I, I think that's it. We're four minutes over, so I will say goodbye. And I will send out a note right now with, with some of the follow-up from today's meeting. So thank you, everybody, and we'll talk, talk again soon. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, bye-bye.